here. Uh, those of you who don't think I am hit the shower this morning, I need to tell you that I'm part of the Movember Challenge. The Movember Challenge is, a, uh, is an awareness uh, propaganda tour for, uh, uh, for uh, male disorders like prostate cancer, etc. And it's about collecting, finding, and moving in new resources towards that type of, uh, that type of research. Enough about that. Uh, my name is Martin Ingvar, I'm uh, uh, Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Karolinska Institute. And what does that mean? Well, that means that I have on my, ta on my desk, I have this position. I'm looking into the future, seeing what's coming. Uh, because uh, the, face, the face of the uh, research services and the face of clinical, uh, clinical work in hospitals and in healthcare is changing, changing very rapidly. We're right now moving, moving into the type of industrialization that uh, pulp industry and car industry went into back in the end of the 60s. The only difference is that we're dealing with a very complex matter, namely patients. Patients do have their own will, their own free will. And as they have their own free will, we are dealing with a system that is more than complicated. It is complex. And what's the difference between complex and complicated? The difference between complex and complicated is very easy to say. In a complicated system, you can sit there, you can watch the system, and then suddenly you go, yeah! I understand it. And then you do the right thing and the system will behave. And we still have that idea. Politicians have that idea. The general, uh, general public ha has that idea uh, on healthcare. It's just a matter of analyzing it enough and it will work. The problem is when you're dealing with a complex industry, when you deal with a complex industry, you run into the problem that um, uh, that not only is it complicated, but it matters in what order you do different things, because it changes over time. So you have the time dynamic that makes things very, very difficult to deal with. As I said, we're going through the same thing in healthcare worldwide as the normal industry did in back in the 1990s. And for those of you who would like to understand healthcare, I recommend a 30-year-old book, or a 40-year-old book, the Future Shock book by uh, Alvin Toffler, where he summarized too much change in too short of a time period as being the prime challenge for the industry uh, that, it, that, that he was looking at. Challenge number one. People are getting older. It's not only you and your children. It's you that get older and your parents. And people live longer. And then we say, well, everybody's going to be demented anyway, so what, what does that matter? Well, not really that simple. Because people bec uh, are also becoming healthier and healthier as time goes by, which means that in spite of the fact that we are rapidly increased the number of people over 80, still the health uh, problems do not uh, develop in this, uh, in, at the same speed. But it's still a big challenge. It's a demogra the demographic challenge becomes one big challenge for, uh, for the technological industry. And that is the maintenance of autonomy being able to deal with my own life at my own hand is the biggest challenge that we have in the future. Being able to move around, be able to communicate, be able to do all my uh, societal business, etc., and do that from my home. And with tools that are accessible for me and not for a, only for a 70-year-old with a kiss cap uh, in this direction and, uh, and saying, well, it's only a matter of going out choice, dot, blat. I don't want that. I want simple stuff that talk to me. Or as my mother said when she was 
89 years old. <coughs> Not even this little ID thing that I use is possible for me to use. My fingers hurt, which means that we have, an, uh, we have a ch grand challenge to move the service industry of technology towards accepting people that sort of can do almost everything and not only the 80% that are fully well. Another big challenge is that 98% of subjects that come to the uh, Swedish hospital today, and it's about the same in the US, 98% below the age of 70 have a smartphone. Which means that they come fully diagnosed, fully knowledgeable, and absolutely clear on what's going to happen when they, when, they enter into the, uh, when, when they enter the doctor's office which means that the knowledge monopoly uh, of the profession is dead. And they want to deliver their data. My God, I measured my physical activity for six months. What do you think? You don't want to know that? You tell me I should do physical exercise and you don't want me to get, deliver the data to you? They're crazy. I have my data here. And that is now rapidly moving into healthcare. Mayo Clinic has uh, struck a, um, a um, strategic partnership with IBM and Apple towards integrating patient long-term data into the health trajectory of the individual patients. It's a major step forward. When big players like that go together, the rest of us are going to stand there. Because we are now seeing exactly what the phone industry saw back in 1976 when they sat down and wrote down and said, we don't know what we're going to use it for, but these letters seem pretty good to work on. G-S-M. What happened? It left a 15-year advantage to the European phone industry. And the, the US phone the industry went like that. And for 15 years, they were left behind. And then they came back. And my god, have we heard the comments when the US came back and threw out uh, both Ericsson's phones and, uh, and Nokia's phones out in the woods again, right? So with these big changes that we are seeing now is that we are seeing de facto standards that are entering into the healthcare de facto standards that remove the, the corporate generic stuff and putting in interoperability. There is no other way we can protect the patient's data unless we allow for interoperability between different uh, deliverers. We will not, one hospital will not buy a big system. They will all grow in the same modular fashion and to grow in a modular fashion, you can only do that if you have a common information backbone. The data that patient can deliver is rapidly moving, rapidly moving ahead. Um, today, it's about $40, $40, and you can uh, go to the world's best retail shop, namely Alibaba. And uh, you know, for $40, you can get 19 sensors that you wrap around your arm. Tell you about sleep, physical exercise, uh, uh, movement patterns, stress patterns, blood glucose, blood pressure, heart rate, da 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 da. All the things you don't really want to know, but somebody else should know so that uh, I can deal with my own health. The problem is becoming the same as it is in many other industries. The problem is not to get the information, but to select the information that we get. So healthcare industry now is rapidly developing um, tons of software that is trying to decipher what's important in this bush of uh, information. 
Many of you have heard about Watson, the IBM challenge where, where the, the Watson, Watson uh, software does better in the cancer diagnosis than the best professors at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Sure it does, but I still want to talk to a person. But we have a problem, and that is that people don't always speak the truth when it comes to describing their own biodata. This is wonderful data from the CDC demonstrating on the, let's see, on the left side uh, how people describe their own physical weight. And on the left side, it's what you measure if you put them on a scale. And uh, uh, looking at it, you can, you can see that sort of on average, everybody describes themselves as a bit more slim than they are on average. And, and, it's, and it's the same thing when if you ask people about their mathematical skills. In average, people are a little bit better than average. That's what they said. It's what we call f uh, physiological, uh, uh, physiological self-exaggeration. And, and it's good, it makes life meaningful, but it's very difficult when you deal in health matters. What we do when we scan the body continuously, which is, now, uh, uh, which is now moving along, is that we get a lot of noise and we get a, lot, a time series of data that really means something. And this also means that we can get predictive power in the data that we have. There is a one wonderful measure, HRV, heart rate variability. So when you breathe in and you breathe out, the, the heart gets blood back or not. And if you vary your heart rate a lot over the breathing cycle, that means that your heart works simply by the way the blood is flowing through the heart. But if it doesn't vary, that means that your brain stress is holding your heart like this. And when we, when we look into those types of data over a long time, we can see that people with a stiff HRV, they die much faster than the, 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 the other guys. That's one thing. The other thing is that things like yoga and stuff really works. And suddenly we're dealing with a knowledge that is not, has not previously been accessible to healthcare when it comes to public health issues, uh, anti-stress treatment, etc. So what, what I'm saying is that providing we have the right thinking behind it, this type of, uh, of uh, long-term data will really change the face of the health. And what are the me methods by which we're going to do that? Well, first of all, these, these wearables uh, are going to, I mean, are storming ahead right now. Most of them today are really done, but uh, I tell you, around the corner, we have a lot of fun stuff coming up. The second thing is, of course, that everybody wears a terminal. I know where you are. Uh, NSA knows where I am. Uh, and uh, I know how I feel. The problem is, as I said, we get a statistical landscape that's a pretty wiggly. And in that wiggly landscape, uh, it's easy to say that people that look a bit like that, that belong to that group, that category, they have that type of health, etc. The problem for healthcare is that the patients are really not interested in what happens to their peers. They're interested in what happens to them as individuals. And getting the precision down to the individual level is really the difficult thing. I mean, I wouldn't be happy if my doctor told me that you were 0.7 dead. I, I mean, for me, that's a pretty binary thing. The industrialization is moving on. Uh, it's moving on, and uh, people are being taken care of at the, what's called the lowest effective care level. That means that it's pretty, it's so 1990s to be in the hospital. It's really old-fashioned. 
And, uh, and uh, that's one thing with industrialization. The other thing is that I, as a doctor, do not apply my knowledge. I apply the system's knowledge, i.e. the full evidence base when I do my decisions. And that's pretty hard for a profession to move away from being king of the room to be a servant of the greater good. That's really, really tough for us. And then <coughs> the, the, the data industry, the ICT industry, comes up with the possibility to measure not only if the patient gets well, but if I do my job, if I adhere to the protocol. And we have multiple demonstrations showing this. Say the, the, the European Leukemia Register. Very simple, we know that if you, if you treat for that biomarker and direct all your treatment towards getting that well, we know that the kid is going to survive. And if we fail to do that, we get a greater risk that the kid will not survive. Okay, so we went in and measured adherence to protocol, put it uh, against the survival numbers for all European countries. And what happens? Obedient Swedish oncologists did very well. Whereas, um, well, there are, there, are other, uh, there are other healthcare systems. They pay just as much, but they got 20% uh, poorer survival <laughs> rates. They had the same information, they applied it in a different uh, way, and they got difference in survival. So now with this, since the thinking is done, and it's all of only about adherence to protocol, we've now driven up the survival rates in all of Europe, in all the countries that have applied to this, to, uh, to numbers that were not seen 25 years ago in any country. So all of them have now surpassed number one 20, 25 years ago, and no new medicines in the meantime. Just adherence to protocol. Before industrialization, the doctor was king. I owned my knowledge, I owned my tools, I worked in my work unit, and that was also my social group. So you guys better do what I say, or I will treat you as outgroup. That's the greatest human punishment. That's why fa Facebook is so popular. The problem is it's a limited potential for rationalization of such a unit. It works very flexible. It works iteratively. But the problem is you can't ask them to do things quicker. When you do, they will do it, but they will also have all the information in their head. So if you ask a nurse today in a modern hospital, he or she will, uh, will have the working memory full of logistics. Not medical problems, not care problems, but logistics. How do I get this person out of here into the next level? How do I get this one to x-ray? How do I do this one? How do I do that one? There, it's all about logistics because that's what dominates when you move from a long-term stay in the hospital to a very short-term st uh, stay in the hospital. And looking at it, th this is a business tip for you guys. The one that solves the logistics problem in hospital care is going to be rich, much richer than Carlos Slim. <laughs> Remember, hospital, it's a wonderful oppor business opportunity. They still use fax machines. <laughs> and they use, they jot down with a ballpoint pen on a yellow sticker saying that this patient may die if I don't do my job, <laughs> essentially. That's how poorly lo the logistics in, in, uh, in care is, is handled today. Mainly because we have not established the standard for how different care units should communicate. And this is a, a pervasive problem. After industrialization, we become more transaction in, intensive, in, uh, intensive, but the problem with 
the care of industrialization today is that we fail to understand the intense complexity of the patient needs. So the care becomes insensitive to individual, uh, individual, uh, uh, the individuals. And you end, up, you end up having a sort of a mismatch between the delivery and, uh, and the expectation of that delivery. This transaction intensity makes hospitals very good to, to do mechanical hearts in happy 70-year-olds and do good things for them. But when that same 70-year-old is in the hospital, only about one-tenth of the time uh, the, the uh, staff can actually attend to that individual. So it becomes impersonal due to the fact that we haven't cleaned up the service for the people working in an industrialized system. For instance, every day a nurse writes 58 times the, uh, the same information on the same patient. They may ha only have four patients, but still, they still do manual writing of the same information 58 times. 70% of what's documented in the patient documentation, 70% of that information load is repeat of what's already in there. That's how bad information systems today work in, in care. Everything is, of course, we have electric, uh, electric patient data records. Well, sure you have, but you have the logics of an old binder and the reservoir fountain pen. <coughs> we haven't modernized that one. <coughs> Big business opportunity. Fourth grand challenge that we have is that we pay people to do a lot of work. And what do, what do people do then? Well, they do a lot of work, which means that costs are running through the ceiling instead of paying for the health. So we should move people away from, uh, from uh, uh, being there. We're now dealing with the idea that we will have 400 citizens of the Republic of China that will have diabetes in the next 10 years. 400 million, suck on that one. Ooh. 400 million. We're dealing with 12% in the United States. We're dealing with numbers that we have, n we cannot even think of how bad it is. And it all starts with candy and soda, and then some high fructose corn syrup. And then if you smoke, you, you multiply the risk by five. And then the whole show starts with diabetes, inflammation, blood pressure, vascular disorder, cardiac disorder, stroke, kidney disease, cancer, and dementia. All of them belong together. All of them belong together. But the interesting thing, when we look at this little pyramid of death, when we look at that, they all are multiplied in their risk from the way we live our lives. So the, what we should do is, of course, we should, as a health industry, we should move far more into sleep, food, physical activity, and stress, uh, stress management. And what do we do instead? We don't do it because we're not paid for it. We're paid to do highly technological stuff uh, uh, on the purple ones, but we're not paid for it to do the blue things. And the blue things is really where the big money is. About half of the healthcare industry costs lies in the fact that we fail to do the blue ones. Half. 2.1 for dementia, 2.4 no, for dementia, 2.1 for cancer about six times for stroke, uh, about uh, twice for blood pressure, uh, and di in diabetes, uh, you can just look at somebody, ask them what they eat and how they feel, and you can come out with a risk number 48 times that of non-risk uh, non carriers, just by looking at people. That's how predictive these blue uh, uh, these blue guys are. I mean, take for instance if prevention, if, if everybody would walk 500 meters per day, 500 meters, that's really a lot. <laughs> it's proven well beyond doubt 
fact that in all these disorders you will have significant changes in, in, in activity. There, there's data right now coming out demonstrating that uh, that uh, the decline, you know, dementia is pretty bad. The other only good one good thing with dementia and that is that you get to new, meet new friends every day. <laughs> but but the, the bad thing with dementia. When you take people and start moving them around, at, uh, running them at you know really tough program, I think it was 800 meters a day for two years, they were able to score significantly better regarding the cognitive decline than the others in the control group. Two years, they were able to change the trajectory. And if they multiply that with the sort of the risk of developing full-blown, uh, going from slight memory problems to full-blown dementia, it was about nine years delay. And that's pretty significant when you're 70 years. So, you know, to get another decade uh, of uh, recognizing your grandchildren, that's a pretty good thing. <coughs> so the fifth grand challenge that we identified for the future is the sustainable health care. Full access and free market choice is difficult, has a difficulty in, 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 uh, in uh, containing the cost. And, it, uh, and uh, it's a primary challenge to maintain health equity. We see grand experiments today with the implementation of primary care in China. We've been there and visited, and I mean, they're doing great things in China. And we see the breaking up of the American uh, health cartels because of the, 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 the um, you guys are in the US, anybody from the US? Nobody from the US. Over there, over there you are. Over there, they use 18% of the GNP for, for healthcare. Whereas here we use nine and we get twice the survival for uh, mothers giving birth to babies. Duh. Not good. Health equity is a good business. Good information will drive health equity. It's a big challenge for healthcare, uh, for, for ICT in healthcare, to really provide the tools to drive health equity. It's a good business for the business, it's good business for society, and by all means, it's good business for the individuals. If we look at it, all countries uh, that sort of are in development and, and uh, are, are considered developed countries, uh, all of them, the healthcare costs rise quicker than the GMP does. So we have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. The moon is approaching quicker than it's going away. It's really not, not, uh, not a very good thing. So we have to invent <coughs> proper ways of paying healthcare. If we pay healthcare uh, in the like in the left column, f column fee for service, we get a higher mortality than in the left column if we pay for health by capitation. You take care of 200 patients and you get that payment. Do the best you can, keep them healthy. People die less if you pay for health, but if you pay for service, you get a lot of service, but you don't get health. And, and that has now been proven again and again and again that it's actually a mortal business to pay health care, to pay a system the wrong way. Only a well-functioning health care can be the basis for proper clinical research. We need information. We need an information backbone that is a primary challenge for health care because we need the structured information. With structured information, we can get pre-sorting of the data. We can understand the data. We can see what's happening uh, with health in society. And you can, you can then build your information hierarchy from the genetic information uh, and all the way up to the international registers where you can compare different, uh, uh, different healthcare systems. Uh, we're part of the international ITROM challenge, which is the International Consortium for Healthcare Outcome Measurement. We want to know what healthcare provides society with. So the overall idea for us is to really see to that healthcare does not only create costs, but also that it creates a societal value. 
So the grandest of all challenge that I presented today is of course being able to measure the patient value that, uh, that we create. We use proxies like survival and stuff like that. That's not good enough. We need far richer measurements with patient feedback long after they've been in contact with healthcare, telling us what's going to happen. Take one last example. The prostate register of Sweden only measures survival, and we developed the best survival rates in the world. We were pretty happy with that. The German register measured survival rate, incontinence, and uh, sexual function. And they were appalled because they had you know, numbers like 7 or 8 percent leakage after a year and 10 percent impotence, etc. Really bad numbers. They were really upset. And they asked Sweden, what, what, what would you guys, what, what, what do you know? Well, we don't measure it because they're out of the hospital, so we don't measure it. Well, so they started to measure it. And it ended up demonstrating that around here, they survived, but 50% were leaking a year after the operation, and only 40% had a functional sexual life. Pretty bad, so you get what you measure, so measure the right thing by all means. And with that, I've left you with some real challenges for the future. Thank you very much. I have a few uh, initial questions before, and I'm sure the audience also has it, but you talked about the changing roles, and we've talked a lot about transformation.